parents got me involved into this space. I invested in Bitcoin at about $300 back then. And then months later, it turned into almost $900. So when I saw that, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I need to do that again. And ever since then, I just got really pumped, really excited, decided to just jump in, start learning. Um, and then people also thought I was crazy too, because like I said, it wasn't uh, the most popular thing back then, but I fell in love with the space. I fell in love with, you know, investing and trading cryptocurrency. And then later on with blockchain and the applications of it. And I'm like, you know what? I want to combine my passion for this space with my purpose, which I believe is to help people. And so became an educator um, and really decided to launch and start the Crypto Strategy Academy, which is like a full seven week program teaching people how to get into crypto and NFTs and the exciting pieces. Um, and then later on, co-founded uh, Crypto Babes, a community, a global community for women to, of course, educate them, but connect them to like jobs, funding, and even mentorship opportunities within the Web3 space. Okay, so that's a little bit about me, but enough about me. I really want us to actually dive in and talk about some of the exciting pieces. So we're gonna be kicking things off. Of course, today's conversation is a mix of like crypto taxes, of course, alongside with business and Web3. And we're gonna do a quick deep dive into this. Um, so please take notes. If you have questions, drop your questions in the chat, but just kind of curious to know, drop in the chat if you are currently an entrepreneur, if you have a business um, idea or you already have an existing business or want to start a business in general, it doesn't have to be specifically in this area, but just drop a two in the chat if you do have a business. I'm really curious to see who's already in this space um, you know, are already in the business space, I should say, um, or actually interested in starting their own business because we're going to kick things off talking about some of those opportunities of cryptocurrency, NFTs, blockchain, how we can actually start a business in this space. I will let you know, and this is just my personal opinion, I really believe that we're going to continue to see a massive shift, shift of jobs, of innovation, um, and opportunities in this blockchain web three industry. Okay. So if you don't have a business, I'd highly start thinking about it of how you can, of course, become an entrepreneur, but more importantly, if you have an existing business, this is going to be a really great conversation of, you know, eye opening conversation of how you can actually incorporate this technology into your business. Okay. Um, which is really exciting. So we're going to deep dive real quickly and kind of dive into these pieces here, right, of business opportunities in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, okay? Now, anytime I come across literally like any entrepreneur um, and, I'm, you know, we're, we're having conversations and tell me what they do or maybe we're working together, they're a client or whatever the case may be, I'm always letting them know that you should start thinking about getting into this space. Now, the big piece is like, okay, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in like crypto in this industry, but how as a business owner, can I actually take advantage of this space? Like what are some of those few steps or even just concepts or ideas of how I can actually, you know, get involved? And so one of the first ways, and probably in my opinion, one of the simplest ways is through crypto payments, right? Starting to actually accept cryptocurrency as a form of of payment. Now, I can personally say as a business owner and of course a crypto educator, right, I love accepting crypto as a form of payment. Now, you know, especially if you have a global business and you have people internationally that want to be able to pay you for your services, right, or your products, right, this is a great, easy and fast way for anybody, right, that has access to the internet to be able to purchase and participate in your business, right? Compared to the traditional system today where of course they need to, um, you know, have access to a financial institution, whether it's through like having a debit card or a credit card. But one thing I realized as I was learning, you know, about this space and the power of blockchain technology is the fact that a lot of people around the world, right? Even though us in North America are very fortunate, a lot of people around the world still don't have access to financial services. So imagine not being able to have access to credit, right, or mortgage and, and other pieces. So um, cryptocurrency is really breaking down a lot of those barriers. And now simply 
anybody that has access to the internet can create an account and can start participating. Um, and who knows, maybe buy your products because they can just access crypto, right? So now you don't have to actually wait anymore for like these bank transfers or don't have to worry about dealing with cash backs or chargebacks, right? which is huge. A lot of businesses lose a lot of money due to chargebacks as well, right? Um, and then of course, by accepting crypto business, businesses um, can also attract a new audience and increase revenue, right? There's been so many companies, for those that are like in Toronto, there are so many companies in the GTA that have gotten like extra, you know, exposure and in marketing because of the fact that they want, you know, media outlets wanted to highlight them because they accept crypto, right? I think it was literally the other day um, and I totally forgot the name, but I just saw like there's a barber shop that just opened up and literally like the logo on the front of the store is one of like the board ape yacht club, um, you know, apes, right? And it's like, once again, like they accept cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and they're getting a lot of media attention. So this is obviously a really great way to start thinking about incorporating it into your business. And then of course, a lot of people always ask, well, crypto is volatile. What if someone pays me $500 and I go back to look at it and it's down to 300. And that is where um, cryptocurrencies like stable coins that are created to, for the most part, stay stable, right? Are what we like to say pegged at one-on-one -on -one ratio with like the dollar, right? So if someone does pay you in five, you know, $500 in crypto, you're able to go back and check and it's still at $500, right? So you have that stability and at the same time, you're able to expand your reach. If that makes sense, just drop some ones in the chat for me. Okay, because that is so powerful. Now, the second way that you guys can also take advantage of this space is through NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And I'm not going to do a, too much of a deep dive into some of the fundamentals or basics of this. But I, 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 um, overall, I just want you guys to understand that when it comes to NFTs as a business owner, right, and, and kind of just backing up a little bit, NFTs are really just unique digital assets that can come in so many different shapes and forms, right? Right now, I think a lot of people might have seen them in regards to like pictures, um, once again, of these apes that I was talking about, the board apes as well, um, but they can also take the form of like music, right? It could be an audio, it could be a file, right? Um, there's even, you know, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but there's even the concept of taking physical assets and turning them into an NFT, like a digital asset. And I'm going to give you a preview of what that looks like later. Okay. But yes, businesses can use NFTs to monetize the digital assets and create new revenue streams, especially if you have a community around your business, right? NFTs are so community driven and they're so powerful. Okay. So now once again, NFTs also provide a way for these businesses to engage with their audience and build brand loyalty guys, okay? So for those that are like, okay, you know, I have a business, I'm trying to build a community, you wanna be able to have, um, not someone just purchase with you once, but really be a part of your business to feel almost like an ambassador within your company as well. And NFTs are a great way to provide exclusivity to maybe different perks or different benefits, right? Where if they hold your NFT, they get access to all these amazing pieces, right? which is also a really, really, really great way, okay? Now, number three, which is the part that I'm really excited about, okay? And just drop a two in the chat if you um, have purchased an NFT or if you're excited about NFTs or if you've heard of NFTs, drop a two in the chat, okay? But real estate and NFT, let me tell you guys, I get so excited when I think about this opportunity here, right? And this is so, 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 so new, okay? But there's so much opportunities, guys, because even though I said NFTs can be, um, you know, a picture, it could be an audio, and that's what most people, right, that are familiar with NFTs are, are seeing out there in social media, right? But NFTs can be essentially anything because you're taking that, you know, what is, could be like a physical asset and you're turning it into a digital asset. And it has the same characteristics of the fact that, you know, it's secured, it can't be, um, it's like all the information is like not fraudulent, right? And it's a very secured, all that data, right? And you're actually able to prove ownership, which is the biggest piece of what NFTs are really about. So if we're taking the same idea and we're like, okay, and this, especially for my real estate professionals on the call, right? 
if you're I, you're able to take um, or, or prove that you actually have ownership over that property, right? That is powerful. But a lot of times in today's days and age, right? They get mixed up all the time with that documentation. But with an NFT that's on the blockchain, there's no room for error, which is amazing, okay? So um, I also want to shout out one organization. Please do your own research, not financial advice for this entire call, by the way. <laughs> Consider that your disclaimer. Um, but there is an organization called Proppy. And essentially, actually, um, their platform allows users to actually buy and sell real estate using blockchain, right? Which means this is reducing the paperwork, right? And we all know the real estate process can be very slow, okay? Um, but what's exciting about blockchain now, it speeds up that process because essentially you're able to take out that middleman and really just focus on completing those transactions, right? So this, of course, increases efficiency, right, within the real estate sector, right? Now, this specific platform also allows users to purchase and sell fractional ownership of properties using NFTs. So as an example, if you take, let's say, a condo building that you own, you turn it into an NFT, right? It's just that data and ownership is now on the blockchain. You can actually, because it's digital, you can actually divide, right, um, that NFT, that digital asset. And now you can have fractional ownerships where multiple people can have ownerships in that property, right? Be able to buy and sell with ease, which is powerful guys i hope you guys are seeing what i'm getting what i'm getting at here if you understand the vision of what i just told you please drop some dollar signs because this is powerful okay um and i always get so excited so 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 excited talking about this week okay um but if you haven't done research please go do some research look into this because it is coming um and we're so early that you can literally start a business in the same industry right if you're in this space right or looking to get in okay now, one other quick uh, and piece that I also really love in terms of how blockchain is also being used in businesses, and I'm, if you notice, I'm also giving you guys examples, okay? This is not just, I'm not just talking about these ideas of how this technology is being used. I'm also showing you there's companies today that are already using it, okay? Already using it, which means it's already being done, okay? But yes, blockchain in supply chain. This is exciting um, and it's so powerful, okay? So yes, we understand that blockchain technology can really change the game when it comes to supply chain because it provides transparency, right? Which means everybody can see the information, right? Of, um, you know, let's say their goods being able to go from like the farmers all the way to the store, right? You can actually see all that data. It's secure, right? So you don't have to worry about that data being tampered with and it's efficient, right? Which is so powerful, okay? And this is why we have so many companies that are using blockchain to actually track and trace their goods, monitor, of course, um, the inventory levels and authenticate product origin, which is huge. And I'm excited to say, if you guys look at the very bottom there, Walmart is actually using blockchain technology, guys. Like they're already doing it right? Which is powerful because once again, they're able to track the origin and the journey of the food products that they have, right? Using blockchain technology, right? Um, and now because of that, they can improve food safety because we all know that's an issue, right? Whenever they have those recalls on items, right? And on top of that, they're able to reduce waste, which is so big, okay? Um, then we also have Nestle as well that also uses blockchain. Same thing, that concept of you know, traceability when it comes to their coffee beans, right? But also goes back to having um, and ensuring that the sourcing that they're doing is ethical and sustainable, which is huge, okay? So I just gave you guys some really good ideas of as to how, you know, you as a business owner can start using crypto um, or NFTs or even blockchain in your business. Or if you don't have a business, I literally just gave you a few business ideas for free, okay, um, which is super, super cool. So if you haven't done that, please definitely go do some research about some of those exciting areas of how you can really, really dive in, okay? Um, but now we're actually gonna shift gears just a little bit here. We're gonna get to the fun stuff or the more fun stuff, I should say, uh, in regards to crypto taxes. And I'm so, so, so excited because they have so many amazing professionals here 
that are on today's call that are gonna be breaking down some of the sauce for us. So we do have Dylan, Danny, as well as Rebecca, who are experts when it comes to the financial side and more specifically when it comes to bookkeeping and cryptocurrency taxes um, as well. So I'm gonna stop here. I wanna get these amazing individuals to introduce themselves, okay? Before we jump into all the amazing questions, which I know everybody's excited to jump in on. If you're excited for this conversation, guys, for crypto taxes, drop some dollar signs, hype it up and show them some love for this conversation because I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. It's tax season and it's important for us to make sure we're doing everything properly, especially because I know a lot of us did a lot of investing last year. Um, so we wanna make sure we do it the right way. And for those that are in Canada, we know that Canada can be pretty strict when it comes to these regulations too. So we wanna make sure we have all the information to really do this properly. Okay, so um, let's kick things off. I'm gonna throw it over to Dan, uh, actually start with Dylan first, um, to introduce yourself, your background in this space as well, but welcome. Yeah, hey guys, nice to meet you all. So I've worked with Mike Bookley. I'm the crypto specialist at the firm. Um, I jump in this industry probably around uh, the same time as Ashley, 2018, 2019. Same idea, my parents actually got me into this. I had my accounting degree at the time. Uh, they brought the idea of an open ledger that's public that you can verify. I thought it was a very strong idea and kind of brought me into the space. Uh, from there, I decided to do a couple of courses in uh, blockchain fundamentals for accounting purposes, as well as finishing a master in blockchain technology here in, in Europe. Um, that kind of sparked a, le a little bit of a passion for me in the blockchain industry and just the education part about how important it is to um, be aware of the, the compliance and the tax regulations around it and how there's not really much information out there in the, in the past couple of years. So we are, we're happy to explain to all everybody and kind of educate people so you can actually be part of this industry. Awesome, I love it. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'm gonna throw it over to Danny, welcome. Hey everyone, I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so my name is Danny. I am the founder and managing director of My Bookly. Uh, my background, I'm an, I've been an accountant for the last now what, 12 years. So it kind of says a lot how old I'm really am lately. Um, I got into the crypto space uh, kind of recently as um, I kind of got introduced from one of our clients when they were kind of dealing with crypto transactions for their online businesses. So um, a lot of what my book really provides, especially our entire team is e-commerce level work. So if you're selling products on Amazon, Shopify, so forth, it's pretty much the form of e-commerce and somehow crypto is kind of tied into that ethos of uh trend of uh, networking and service in business so, so surely enough i kind of dug more about the crypto side got a lot more help from dylan then started to join on these networking events and then surely enough i'm pretty much neck deep into crypto and pretty much knowing the knowing how i could how the crypto space works and how that ties into the traditional level of finance accounting and tax Amazing. Thank you so much for being with us today. And of course, Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Feel free to introduce yourself. Thanks for being with us today. Hi, thank you for having me. I am a certified public accountant located in the DC area. I started my cryptocurrency, actually started my business at the same time I started really delving into cryptocurrency back in 2017. Since then, I've helped other CPAs create courses to teach tax pro, um, other tax professionals how to reconcile cryptocurrency, um, putting it on tax returns and that sort of thing. Um, I've had uh, clients in about six continents. So it's been actually a, a very interesting ride. Most people come to me to uh, put their ledgers together. I'm not allowed to do other you know, tax returns in other countries. So I strictly deal with US and US clients, but I've had people all over the world reach out to me uh, for assistance since uh, there are a lack of accountants that are in this space are interested in really advising in this space. So been in since 2017, uh, built my business off of crypto. Actually, before we started this, I was just reconciling another ledger. It's been an interesting ride so far. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I am so pumped, guys. This is going to be a good conversation. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive right in. So 
Um, the first question, and of course, keeping it super simple um, and started, starting off with the foundations is like, you know, how does cryptocurrency taxes really work, um, essentially? So I'm going to kick this off and let's throw it to Rebecca to start us off. Well, it depends on what we're talking about. So in the U.S., <laughs> if you trade cryptocurrency, that goes on one section of the return. If you are receiving cryptocurrency as payment, that goes in another section of the return. If you're passively staking, um, uh, yield farming, that goes in. A, so it really just depends. It's, it, it's, multi, it's multifaceted. It's not straightforward. The IRS has done their best to um, answer as many questions as they can uh, from, from other professionals and, uh, you know, investors alike regarding hard forks, airdrops, staking, trades. Um, I know the wash sale even came into play uh, for a short bit last year. So it's pretty complicated. It's not straightforward. This is an area where I would really say that if you're doing a lot in cryptocurrency, you definitely want to seek a professional. Awesome. I'm going to throw this over to the Bookly team to, to jump in um, in, in being able to add value to this question too. Yeah, I can take I can take on this one. Uh, so on the Canadian side, it's kind of similar to what's kind of shown in the US for what Rebecca mentioned. So it's kind of treated of one of two ways. It's either considered as an income or it's going to be treated as a capital gain. And that's depending on how what's the intended use of that form of crypto. So let's say you have a business and you're selling products and you're accepting crypto, then obviously that's a form of income. But let's say you're exchanging crypto with some other type of currency and you're trying to make a gain in between, then that is going to be treated as a capital gain. And with that form of capital gain, 50% of it, it's considered taxable and then has to be added onto your return. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, and I think the, the common thing we're seeing here really just depends on, I guess, how you are doing like what you're doing with these transactions and and how you're really you know participating in the space like what your involvement looks like right so um I, I think that's super powerful and i hope you guys are realizing too right that disclaimer as everything that we're talking about please still do your own research right um but at the same time too the regulations are different based on where you're located right so please keep that in mind because i know this is virtual we have people literally from like all over um but keep that in mind as we kind of go through this as well okay um, now, the next question is, I think, a question that is definitely probably at the top of everyone's mind for sure, but are crypto to crypto trades taxed? And do I have to pay tax if I transfer crypto from like one wallet to another? Um, and I'm going to send this over to Dylan to kind of kick us off. Yeah, for sure. So uh, depending where you are, because I know here we're from everywhere, so Canada and the U.S., but in general, crypto to crypto, if you're doing exchange, there's a capital gain on that sales, right? Because the depending on where you are, it's not treated as a currency. And that don't mean treated as a currency because you're, you're making a gain in that interchange, you gotta claim that. Uh, the only times that you don't really have a taxable event is when you're transferring from your wallet to your own wallet, KYC to KYC. Um, if you're not using a non-KYC, you can even get in trouble for that because there's no way to prove that you're not sending it to yourself. Um, if you're holding crypto, you don't have to pay taxes. Um, some countries actually now they're ta taxing you on unrealized gains, uh, which is not a really good thing for the bit for the industry. Um, as well as um, the last thing will be if you buy crypto, you also don't get tax char charged taxes. Awesome, Danny. Did you want to add anything to that piece as well? Uh, Dylan definitely just nailed all the points, so I can get this all job. Okay, perfect, perfect. And I send it over to Rebecca as well. Um, I guess how or, or what does this space look like, especially for let's say like the U.S. Um, yep. Kind of curious. It's, it's pretty similar. Uh, crypto to crypto trades, even going to a stable coin such as if you go from Bitcoin to USDC, that's a taxable event. Um, you'll be calculating whether or not you lost. Uh, gains or losses on that particular trade um, and transferring from a wallet to another wallet is not a taxable event and depending on what software you use you may need to be aware of that one thing i'm finding with a lot of crypto clients is that for example <laughs> a client i just met with um, there's a withdrawal but we don't know where it went 
And th that type of um, activity where we have missing holes, as I like to call them, can affect your overall calculation. So transfers to from one wallet to another are not taxable, but definitely know where your crypto is. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Cool. If we want, yeah, one more thing I wanted to add that when you're doing crypt the crypto, the other thing you always got to think, and even crypto to a fiat, it's um, depending the type of costing method you're using and where you are. So if it's, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure the United States and Rebecca, correct me if I'm wrong, same as Canada, it's FIFL. So that means like first in, first out. So it's the first crypto you bought. So if you bought a crypto in 2016 at $800 and you sold it right now, at, you know, price today is 25, you're having that whole gain. Even if you bought one last week, you're, you're selling first the one you bought uh, first. So you have a huge capital gain and that a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of uh, uh, they try to use the average cost in and then you can get in trouble with the CRA or you can get in trouble with the IRS because you need to understand the importance about using this, the, per the exact cost method that your um, revenue agency actually uses. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with that. So in the U.S., we're required to use FIFO or spe specific identification. And what specific identification is, your best guess. The IRS hasn't clarified it for us. So in this instance, I have seen other tax professionals using LIFO, um, using weighted average, using um, optimize, where they just choose the pool. As long as the pool is clearly identified, they're allowed to use the pool to calculate the overall gains. Um, what I tell people in the US is that whatever method you choose, stay consistent. You can't flip flop from year to year. If you know, if one year you get a better result than the other using a different method, that's not allowed. Whatever method you do, you have to stay consistent in. And it only makes sense because some of the softwares, when they're when they're choosing their pools of the cost lots, the cost basis, um, they don't eliminate them if you flip to something else. So a lot of people get confused and they're like, oh, well, this is going to produce a shorter, uh, uh, less taxes for me. I want to choose that. If you're audited and, and they see that from year to year you're flopping, you could go back and have to, they'll restate your tax returns and it'll come up with penalties if you end up owing more money that year, so on and so forth. As well, we, we need to remember that because the, the, the blockchain is public, right? All the information is out there. So in the case of, I'm not sure in the case of IRS, but CRA can go back seven years into your information and that information is currently on the blockchain. So when forensic, uh, forensic accounting for crypto, which is the, the new area that is exploring right now, they can go back and start tracking where the coin is specifically or that hash number has been to and where it has passed and they can follow out through so if you start using different methods, it's very easy to catch up and you know, you're gonna get fines one day. Yeah, that's so powerful. I hope you guys are taking notes because this is like gems right here. And I'm actually kind of curious too, because I think both Dylan and Rebecca, you had mentioned something in regards to when we're talking about crypto to crypto, uh, like moving funds from one crypto wallet to another, what, what, I guess, what are the steps for those that, you know, are all for like decentralization and are participating in these decentralized wallets, right? Where technically that data is not necessarily shown to everybody or it's not as easily accessible. So what does that look like in terms of like tips or, or steps? There are some um, websites out here that actually search the blockchain. Um, there's DeFi, um, I can't remember their names right now, so please forgive me, but there's like a DeFi Ethereum where we can try to piece things together. Um, generally though, I'll be honest with you, I have my clients, I tell them that if they're interested in exploring like a DeFi exchange or something like that, they should have also good record keeping. Remember, this is cryptocurrency. You are your own bank, which means you're keeping your own records. And if you are unable to produce records, that's going to cause holes in your ledger, which is going to ultimately affect your tax calculations. So since you're your own bank, you have to keep your own records. And if you're using any exchanges that don't provide any exchanges, wallets, anything that does not provide activity, you should be pulling out an Excel file, recording your date and time and how much this transaction was and if you sent it somewhere and all this other stuff. Yeah. 
the, the, the idea when, when you have a non-KYC wallet, you got to treat it as its own company, its own person, right? Because there's now nothing associated, no identity associated with that. So if you're an accountant or the, or the CRA or the IRS and they're looking at this and you send money to that, they could be like, hey, like, I don't know, this is you. Like, um, for me, that's a sale or, or, that, or you're giving income or you're give, gifting income, whatever it is. They don't know that's recognized to you. So on a big perspective, if, then, if you're not providing that information, hey, this is my non-KYC wallet, which the idea of you is not to provide it, but you got to assume those risks, right? It's like, if you're not, not using a non-KYC wallet and you don't want to share that information, then you need to assume the tax consequences associated with it. If you're not willing to assume the tax consequences, then you got to show that, that you own that non-KYC wallet. So risk and reward, you got to decide which, which one of the sides, but you can't win both. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I guess I'm kind of curious to know, and of course, totally optional question, but I guess for, for you guys in terms of like the, the platforms that you guys like to participate in, like, would you prefer or would you recommend decentralized wallets or would you say it's better for everyday cryptocurrency investors to focus on like centralized platforms? This, this ultimately depends on what's the intent of use. It could be... If you want to go for a decentralized wallet, or be, be our guest. But if it's, but you have to kind of keep in mind anything. Well, what Dylan mentioned, your risk comes with reward. If you're gonna go something that's uh, non decentralized, like a non KYC wallet, then you gotta understand there's gonna be a higher risk where you're eventually gonna lose your key. You're gonna lose something at the end of the day. But if you go with a something that's a little bit more centralized or something that's more controlled through a KYC protocol, then yeah, that's better. But obviously, the use case means that yeah, you have intended use for that. You're, Try to track your income, try to track some form of currency. You also got to think like it's 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 okay to have a non KYC wallet. Like I own a non KYC wallet for some of my my funds, right? And and that's where I hold my long term. And that's um, I'm not I don't share that information or like what it is to to everybody. If the government calls ask me, say, like, hey, like what is this transaction? Well, this is my non KYC wallet. And the government like tell it because I don't want to have any tax issues, but I don't tell the rest of the world, right? In, in that sense, um, so. At saying they say like security comes to the rest. If you have centralized, we see what happened over the past couple of years, right? You're you're not what the word is uh, not your keys, not your coins, right? Uh, but if you're taking the full non-KYC and you want to go with a ledger, uh, something else, you you gotta also assume the risk. Like what if you lose it? What if uh, you know you forget your C phrase? Uh, you know, do what are the tax consequences of me sending to that wallet? And yet I don't want to declare it. I want to hide it. Like all those things you got to keep in mind when you make these decisions. I'll say for me, I let my clients decide. I just make sure that they understand because again, I'm doing this with the clients and there's times where I'm spending up to 30 hours with a client trying to reconcile a cryptocurrency ledger because there's so much movement, different wallets, different exchanges. We don't know where the coins are, that sort of thing. So I normally, um, I, I have my clients go through the pain with me of putting this stuff together. And then they can make the choice of what they, uh, of what platforms they want to use when they see what's going to be required to get the information that's needed for their tax returns. Personally, I buy my cryptocurrency on Coinbase and I send it to a treasure. Yeah, like that one more thing on that and it's for the people that are in Canada. Um, this, as I said, it's not a, an advice on what to use, but a lot of times what we recommend is the ones that are listed with the CRA or the Canadian business that have licenses in Canada rather than the ones that don't. And that comes just for the reason of, you know, um, if the client has an issue after it's on us, we'll wanna be following the rules to, the, to, the, to what the CRA asks us and they wanna be using the exchanges that they allowed, right? Um, and that's easy, easy to find. It's just a, a link on the CRA where you can type in um, crypto exchanges allowed in Canada and we just pop up. I believe right now it's, it's about three of them or four that are uh, new on check pay, uh, and I think bit by, and there's one more that uh, that's in there. Um, but that's for the Canadian side. Uh, Rebecca and in the in in the US, you know, everybody knows Coinbase, and they work pretty close with, you know, the the the, the government. So it's a, it's a little bit more secure than um, you know decentralized exchanges out there. Right, but we don't have a list like Canada. Um, as of right now, we're free to go wherever we want. Very interesting. I appreciate the transparency. 
um, when it comes to that. And it's, it's true. Like we have to understand what we're getting into. If we're going to be our own banks that has its own responsibilities and risks, right? I think a lot of people just think it looks attractive, which it can, it can be, but it's like really understanding what you're getting into going down that path versus just jumping in. Right. Um, so I appreciate that for sure. Um, the next question to kind of change things up a little bit, right, is, you know, this is definitely a question I've had people ask me, and this is that one of those gray areas, right, and feel free to answer the, to the best of your abilities, but there are some people that may be wondering, how can I avoid paying tax on, on Bitcoin trades, or like the best way to go about it, I guess you could say. The best way to go about paying taxes on cryptocurrency trades in the U.S., is holding your cryptocurrency long term and not making any more than I believe it's 40,000 a year. If you do not have a job and all you do is trade crypto and you hold your crypto for a year, at least a year, the long term capital gains is 0%. I believe it's under 40,000, but uh, don't quote me on that number. <laughs> I actually had this happen to a client before. That's why I'm saying that. But overall, how do you avoid paying taxes on crypto on your Bitcoin trades? Don't trade. <laughs> Never sell. Um, we, on that term, in Canada, it's a little more complicated. We uh, unlucky we don't have those uh, zero percent capital gain taxes or income tax, so it, it's a little bit unlucky. The only way that I'll say, like, if you really wanted to, um, you know, step out of the line, it would be to completely work on a decentralized basis. Uh, be your own bank. Do not do any trades with like uh, if you, you you're blocking yourself from the regular financial system, right? So the moment you start saying like, "Hey, I don't want to declare my taxes," you're saying you're not allowed to work with the banks. You're not allowed to buy stuff. Uh, you're not allowed to operate in the social market. So yes, you can operate fully decentralized, but then that money it's not really useful because you can't use it in the in the country you're on right now. And the moment you use it, as I said. The information is public on the blockchain. The CRA can always find you find out six years, seven years from now. It's like, hey, this person that bought, I don't know, this car with to use a cryptocurrency. Where is this wallet came from? How how did this wallet appear? Put put up a name with it, and they can find you like six, seven years from now, right? So it's a uh, you always got to think um, what can I do at the end of the day, and how the the best way scenario here is planning better for taxes. So using different co the costing method and making sure that you're whatever you what you're selling you're selling at the right times you're holding long term um capital gains in canada it's only taxed at a 50 percent so it's a it's a little bit better than the capital gains you get in other countries and the last thing you can do as well and and, and this is not an advice but there is a lot of crypto friendly countries out there uh for example Germany, after one year for holding long term, you don't get tax on uh, on crypto. Portugal, you don't get tax on crypto after one year as well. Um, if you hold it for less than a year, I believe it's about 27%. Singapore, Singapore, Hong Kong, no tax on capital gains. So it really depends on what you want to do. There is we live on a on a world right now that's pretty much without borders. So if you're planning on becoming a trader and you want to travel around the world, there is all the areas that can help you and assist you to pay a lot less taxes. Currently, right now, uh, Canada is not one of them. Uh, for what I hear, and Rebecca, unless you hold for a long term, you're not really on that space in, in, in the United States. But it all depends on risk and reward and where you want to be at. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So many great points and so many great tips. <laughs> and I love the transparency as well um, when it comes to this, this, this topic here or this question specifically. So I do have another question as well. And I, I think Rebecca touched on it briefly in the beginning. But for those that, you know, took advantage of the exciting NFT craze, sort of buying different NFTs, or maybe for those that are participating in like airdrops or even cryptocurrency staking to be able to earn on their crypto, like how does that work? And, and what's the best way to go about it as well? Okay, so um, again, this is another, it depends. It, it depends, like, what did you receive this for? Did someone pay you your wages in NFTs or was this a reward or or did you trade for it and you're trading back? So it really depends on how you acquire the NFT um, airdrops. That's usually passive income. 
uh, not subject to self-employment taxes and staking again rewards that's uh, um, income not subject to self-employment taxes generally. But again, this is an area where it depends. And I normally tell people to talk to a professional about their specific uh, situation so that they know what they should be doing and how they should be reporting it. Yeah, and I think that and I can talk a, a little bit uh, on the uh, on the Canadian side as well. Uh, for in terms of NFTs, it's if normally it gets treated as business income if you're the one creating the NFT and actually operating and selling. If you're just buying uh, an NFT on OpenSea and then you're selling it somewhere else, then that's a capital gain and it gets treated as a um, as every other capital gain. In terms of um, the the airdrops and the crypto staking, there. There's really not a specific item for Edro specifically, but a gift in crypto is free in Canada. You can give out crypto to your brother, to your mother, to your father, and you're, that's not taxable. But if uh, at the same time, if you're receiving it and you're, you're using that money to move it for funds, that you will need to consider it as a passive income. It all, always depends on the case scenario. If you receive an airdrop from uh, joining, uh, you know, Coinbase gives you some free coins here and there, right? When you're you're doing the test. In Canada, those are not considered passive income. But if you're, um, you know, uh, on, for example, on Nexo Exchange, that gives you uh, a yielding, right? Those yields, those are passive income there or interest income that you got to declare on your taxes. So it always depends. You got to look at the overview of the situation and what am I doing with this money? How am I getting it? And then from there, you can make the better decision when you talk to your tax specialist or accountant. That makes sense. And I guess a follow up question for that piece um, for those that are just starting out, what would you say is like the maybe the, the best way to start tracking a lot of those transactions um, in all those funds and, and, and transactions or trades that they're doing? Is there any specific platforms or uh, specific methods that kind of come to mind? Uh, there are tons of crypto software out there. I'm not getting paid by any, so I'm not going to broadcast any, but there's a ton of them out there. Go look, do your research, uh, see what other consumers are saying regarding the software product. Um, check out the training videos. A lot of them include training videos to try to help people reconcile their cryptocurrency. Uh, but I would be using software. And then again, if you're using an exchange or a, a DeFi wallet, make sure you're recording all of this stuff on an Excel file. I literally have my clients do it because again, if we're missing pieces of the information, we cannot reconcile your crypto and your tax return, your, your tax reports won't be correct. So, yeah. Uh, us or some of the Canadian platforms uh, kind of being kind of in the same boat as Rebecca. I'm not really being paid or sponsored for these. So obviously do your research, but I can give you, some names that a lot of our clients and some of our history, some of our past history, we kind of know that's kind of been the go-to place. Um, so ShakePay, Newton, Coinbase, these are some of the platforms that will be used for moving when it comes to using crypto or some form of NFT-based, uh, well, NFT-based holdings. Um, these are, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna say I would recommend them, but definitely do your research, check them out before you get into them. Nexo is uh, a decent one as well, but again, uh, do your research you know, as as always, just to kind of get just to uh, start using the wallets. And in terms of keeping the records, I would say as well that uh, it depends on what your operation is. So if you're, you know, if you had twenty to twenty five transactions throughout the year, you can you know download the CSV file from the exchange you're using it and kind of keep up fairly easy track with it. If you don't do a lot of movements, as Rebecca can say, if you're moving money from one exchange to another exchange to another exchange to another exchange, then it becomes a little more difficult. If you're using like a, a trading bot, you know, I have clients that bring me 7,000 transactions in three months. And it's like, all right, well, we can do this manually. We can use an Excel spreadsheet on this. We, we need to use a, an accounting tax software, crypto software, and we got to push. I think it froze. Not sure if you can still hear us, Dylan, but I think it froze. I think you okay, froze. we're gonna. Yeah, do you want to jump in, Danny? Uh, I, you know, I just, I'm trying to see where he stopped at. Let me, let me see. Let me see if I can get a hold back. Hold back of him. Oh, he's no. getting back to me. 
Uh, yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a, a still a really interesting question. And yes, I, I think a lot of this is like case on case basis, as Rebecca said, right? Because depending on how you're using these assets, these digital assets, how you're participating in them, or what what the source is, right? Where it's coming from, I think all kind of plays a role, and everyone has a different situation. I think what uh, Dylan was kind of leaving off. Of yeah, sorry saying, guys. <laughs> We can hear I don't you. know where I got caught up. I don't know. I'm not sure where I got caught up. You were just mentioning you had clients that had like 7,000. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, a lot of people, you know, I had uh, clients that come up to me and they do, uh, they use like uh, so it's like three commas, which are trading bots, right? And these people, they, they have one coin where they do a thousand transactions in a matter of two weeks. And they come up to me and they bring me, you know, a million transactions that we can't go one by one on a manual basis. We got to start using like tax software that can properly import all this data. And then from there, we need to double check the work and make sure, as Rebecca said, that we have the cost for each one of them. Because if we don't have the initial information, then there's not a proper accounting of the cost basis and your capital gains gets all screwed, right? It, it could be a lot higher than it is, or it could be a lot lower than it's supposed to be. Um, so. It, as I said, you depend on the amount of transactions you use it, you can stick with the old school manual, like use an Excel spreadsheet, follow up, make sure you're putting whatever you buy, whenever you sell. Or if you're actually an active day trader, you use different exchanges. What I fully recommend is to keep tracks, keep downloading CSV files, making sure you connect with an accountant, make sure they, they're aware of what they're doing, that they use the proper crypto tax software. And then once they finish up their work, double check that what they're putting through is correct because uh, you always kind of classify is it's a mining income, is this a uh, capital gain, is this uh, NFT, is this an airdrop, is this, is this staking income, right? Um, when you're looking at an, an a spreadsheet, uh, not a lot of times it tells you exactly what it is, right? So you always got to uh, double check your work and making sure that you communicate all the information. What do you do with that wallet? to your accountant, right? Is this my wallet where my mining income is coming? This is what my wallet where my business income is coming. This is my wallet where I do my day trading. So if you're organized things like how you do it with a, a regular bank account, then it becomes a lot easier when tax season comes along because you just say, hey, this is the wallet that receives this type of income. This is the wallet that receives this type of income, right? Wallets are free to create most of the time. So it's not a, it's not a hard thing to have multiple wallets for multiple, for different purposes. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so much amazing and powerful information. I am so, so, so pumped. Um, I am going to also ask this question because I think we touched on it a little bit. I know we have, um, or a lot of you um, for, have clients in different places, but just from a high level, I guess, um, and of course, from a general perspective, I guess, how does like the crypto tax regulation kind of differ between like Canada, the US and international as well? Um, I know we had some questions kind of asking around Dubai as well, just from a high level. Yeah, I can, I, I can touch into that. I'm not an expert on uh, all the regulations here. I'm sure Brevika probably knows a little bit more than me on, on that area. But um, in, in terms of uh, when you look at a general, as we said earlier, you always want to see what am I using this money for? What is, is it the income or, or is capital gain? And that's pretty much straight for every other country. The only part that defer is what you, how do you treat those things? Is capital gains taxable in your country or is it not taxable? What's your cap, the what's a, a tax rate on your business income? What is it not? And then from there, the other big part that changes, it's how do you see, or how do you evaluate this uh, crypto in your balance sheet or your financial statements, right? Uh, for example, uh, in, in the US, it's considered an um, indefinite intangible asset, similar to what like a trademark is. Well, in Canada, it's, it's treated more of a, a commodity security style. Uh, in, in Spain, it, sorry, in Portugal, it's almost treated like currency. It's same thing with, it, with El Salvador. So in, turn, in general perspective for, um, if you're just day trader, if you're just using it uh, as a side gig, if you're just doing regular, if you just use it you know, for a business perspective, you only need to worry about is this income or is this capital gain? If you have it in your balance sheet, if you're a business, and you're, you're actually operating with that and you have savings and crypto, then you start worrying like, hey, how is my country um, considering this? Is this uh, intangible asset? Is this not intangible asset? Is this a currency? Is this a commodity? 
And that's where it differs a little bit more depending where you are. Perfect, perfect. I appreciate you sharing that. There's so much great information. Um, I, I think we do have like one question. Um, I, I think it's, is it, uh, let me see here, timed, is it? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, if you want to ask that, that quick question. No, you have your hand raised. Not sure if you can hear us. Oops, let me see. Here. I'll put it on the chat. Yeah, or if you have a quick question, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but nonetheless, I really want to say thank you so much um, to all of you for sharing so much sauce. Oh my goodness, this is such powerful information. Um, if you enjoyed it, please just drop some dollar signs in the chat because this is information for especially for those that have been investing a lot in crypto, NFTs, and all these digital assets last year, which we know there was a huge craze around it. This is powerful right? To make sure that you're doing things properly now, as we are starting to see a lot of governments and, and, and uh, countries starting to really hone down when it comes to the regulation piece, right? So um, yeah, definitely want to say thank you to each and every single one of you. Um, there will be an email sent out after today's call with their information for those that feel like reaching out, feel free. Uh, once again, as a reminder, please do your own research um, when it comes to anything and everything that was mentioned um, as part of this panel. But but I am so pumped um, because a lot of this has been just so, so, so powerful as well. So uh, once again, I want to say thank you to each and every single one of you. Um, and if you haven't done so already, make sure to, to, to take a picture of their amazing content um, and their, their logos and stuff like that. But like I said, I will be sending out an email with all their data and information as well. Thank you guys for everything. Huh? Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome, awesome. So guys, we've covered a lot of content so far, right? We kicked off the, the call talking about business opportunities um, when it comes to like cryptocurrency and blockchain, of course. Um, and then we kind of also dived in to, um, of course, cryptocurrency tax, right? And understanding how to really navigate that space, how to really deep dive and really get the most out of it as well. Right. And so what's also really exciting, too, is I also want to show you guys, we do have opportunities for those that really want to be able to learn more, of course, about how you can incorporate this technology into your business. Or if you're brand new, which I did notice as well from those that registered on Eventbrite, a lot of you are still fairly new to the cryptocurrency space or even when it comes to some of these different um, trends within Web3. So, of course, it's also one of the reasons why I became an educator because starting my journey back in 2016, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of resources and education available for those that are brand new. And if you haven't participated in like a bull market and a bear market before, it can be a little bit intimidating, right? And so, of course, having that experience, that's why I created the, of course, uh, Crypto Strategy Academy, which is like a full seven-week program. Um, we've also added some amazing uh, new topics to the program too. So of course, we kind of kick things off talking about an introduction to like blockchain and crypto, of course, security, because that's so important. Um, and then week three and week four, we really start talking about the market, what to expect um, in terms of how Bitcoin really moves and understanding like introduction to like trading as well. And then we really shift into some of these exciting trends that we talked about. So this is where we start diving into like NFTs, you know, what are the utilities? How do you actually assess these different potential NFT investments if you are interested in that piece, as well as understanding those, some of the terms that we use as like DeFi and Web3. And of course, summing things up with those business opportunities for those that have a business or are looking to create a business in the space as well. So um, I do, of course, want to give you guys an amazing opportunity to be able to learn more about the Academy as well. And for those that actually tune in for today's call, you will actually get an opportunity to book a free crypto intro call with myself um, to really dive in a little bit more in terms of what your goals are, how you can really get involved in this space and how you can really set yourself up properly for success in this space by doing it the right way and avoiding a lot of those mistakes that I 
had to go through as I just started my journey as well. So we're going to end things here. I want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, for those that joined today's call, feel free to scan the QR code and be able to take advantage of this great opportunity. And once again, I want to say thank you so much to our amazing panelists. Like I said, their information will be sent out via email after today's session. And once again, I say thank you to everyone for tuning in.